Have you ever chased a lovesick mule down a trail in the middle of the night in your underwear and, and boots? That mule kick you in the guts, crack your ribs, and leave you lying beside the trail? When do you go in and help a hound? When do you know when to be patient? Let them work it out. Let them trail, as our guest calls it. Do you believe mountain lions can pick up their scent? We got Cleve Dwyer back on the Houndsman XP podcast, and we're going to talk about all of these topics in this podcast. It was a lot of fun. Cleve uh, sipping coffee out of his Snoopy cup. He got ex- up extra early to join us for this podcast. So we're going to cover a lot of ground here, everything from tracking conditions to uh, all the things I've already mentioned. We had a lot of fun building this podcast for you. Hopefully you'll pick up some tips and some tricks to make you a better mule skinner and houndsman. A lot of good stuff here, folks. I really think you're going to enjoy it. Hey, have you visited our website yet at houndsmanxp.com? We're building it up over there, folks. It's done. It's it's up there waiting for you to stop by and take a look. Seth is adding designs from Outer Agenda on a weekly basis and a lot of fun stuff coming up. And we've got more in the works for you. A lot of good designs. So you can go over there and you check, check it out. You can pick out a hoodie. You can pick out a long sleeve tee, uh, you know, phone cases, insulated tumblers. Everything's over there, folks. You can find it all. And what you do, it's super easy. You just click on our shop tab on houndsmanxp.com. You can follow that into our Redbubble Marketplace. Pick the design that you want and put it on virtually anything that's in that shop. It's super easy. Just go to houndsmanxp.com, click on the shop tab. It'll take you right into that Red Bubble Marketplace. Christmas is coming up. Let's represent Houndsman XP at houndsmanxp.com. Also, check us out on Patreon. Guys, I'm telling you, somebody asked the other day, what is the value of joining us on Patreon at $12 a month? Okay, I'm going to break it down for you as easily as I can. You're going to get a membership to Sportsman's Alliance. Sportsman's Alliance is kicking in a two-knife set and a subscription to their quarterly magazine called The Advocate. Together, that's $70. That's a $70 value. You're going to be eligible for all of our drawings, which equal $100 a month, up to $500 for the semi-annual drawing, and $1,000 for the annual drawing. So do that math. And we're also going to ship you one of our new leather patch caps from Houndsman XP, which is retailing on Dogs Are Treed soon at $30. I'm no math whiz, but $144, we are trying to give you the best value that we possibly can. It is well worth your time. And here's what I really like about it. We've got several people that have already been patrons for a long time. And they are all getting a membership to the Sportsman's Alliance because they have decided that enough is enough. We're not giving up any more freedom. We're going to put our names on the rolls with other great advocates for hunting and hunting freedom. And that's what Sportsman's Alliance is going to do for us. So very happy, very excited to announce this partnership with Sportsman's Alliance and all the other benefits. $12 a month equals $144 a year. Right off the bat, we're going to pay you almost half of that back, not counting the drawings and the other gear that you're going to get. Let freedom ring. That's what Houndsman XP stands for. You can join the roles of other extreme performance houndsmen that want to ensure that we have freedoms for our kids, our grandkids, and well into the future. Let's get the tailgate down on the Old South Dog Box. This is a great episode with Cleve Dwyer. It's time to dump the box. (laughs) Yeah, I guess we can talk about that. Um, You bet we're going to talk about it and the recording's rolling. So I'm not sure when we'll talk about it in this conversation. But uh, see, you got all serious when I told you the recording was rolling, Cleve. You're sitting there having a good morning. You're drinking coffee out of your Snoopy cup. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Yep. So it's been a while since we've talked to you, Cleve, and you've been, man, you've been a busy dude. I'm telling you, you've been, for one thing, you guys, you guys 
bagged some monster toms this past year. You guys, you guys were lighting up Instagram with your your lion pictures. You guys have a how do you how do you rate your season for twenty twenty two? It's it's pretty good, probably, probably about normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about average, I guess. Or, yeah, it's it's a little better than maybe a little bit better than average. Just the amount of people we took, you know. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe it was because you know I saw more of it on on Instagram and Facebook on your social media platforms than I have in the past, but uh, seemed like every other day you guys were posting a picture of somebody big grip and grin, arms wrapped around a a big tom lion. So yeah, yeah, we killed some some really big ones last year. So was the uh, was the weather good, or I mean, I mean, what what was the secret? Are you going to tell us the secret of your success? No, yeah, the weather the, weather wasn't the best. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of warmer weather, and there wasn't much snow, so it kept a lot of guys that don't hunt dry ground and kept them at home, you know, more. But, yeah, but you could get around quite a bit too, so that helped. You know, so when the when you guys get snow in that country, I mean, you guys looking at. Uh, how much snow are you looking at, and or is it more icy road conditions, or is it deep snow? Um, up up north and like down in central Nevada, it gets it gets a fair amount of snow. Sometimes you get into well three foot three foot deep up in the high country, you know, or yeah, you know eight eight thousand feet, seven thousand feet. Sometimes you'll get mm-hmm. drifts that are three feet deep, but most time it's six to eight inches deep. Yeah, and then that burns off, and you're back to like fifty snow, fifty. Fifty percent snow, fifty percent dry ground, and then just roll. When it melts off, I bet those. What are the roads like? I bet they're a muddy mess, aren't they? <clears throat> yeah, some of them are. Especially getting like, kind of got like a, it's almost like a caliche gumbo type clay out in the valleys, and it's it. It's not too bad because most time you can get back past it if you got good roads going across it. But sometimes if you take the wrong road, you you're buried in it. We're we were hunting the South Hills, uh, just south of Twin Falls there one year. And, um, we were coming in from Twin and we had to come up through that, that mud slick. That was the most intense part of the driving in the mountains was getting across, you know, up through the hills in that mud. We were in four wheel drive and it was just like sideways all the way up through there it was crazy and that's not too far from where you guys are hunting no no that's uh, that's not far at all yeah find lines coming out of there when they cross into nevada before you know Mm -hmm. but yeah up in that part of the country it gets pretty pretty slimy it was greasy man it was it was the only place i've seen mud like that is with was when we're hunting the navajo actually got over on the hopi reservation uh gary roberts uh, I think he's recovered by now. Gary Robertson was driving, and uh, man, he had that that truck sliding sideways all the way through there. And if you slid off, I mean, there was nothing to tie to to winch yourself out. If you got over in, the, you know, off the off the off the road at all and got got bogged down, it was it was intense. And we were a long way from anything. We were taking inventory on jerky and water and seeing what we had in the truck to keep us alive for the morning <laughs> until morning until it could freeze. Yeah, yeah, it's slimy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, what else you been up to? Oh, just been working and then train, starting some mules. And uh, Becky and I've been starting a couple mules, and my brother's been starting one. So we got three, three young mules we're starting. So yeah, that's what we did yesterday. Yeah. Her and I went to the mountain. We took we took a young mule with us, and we packed her and, and rode the other two, looking for line track. And, but um that's what we did yesterday and then today i'm just fixing the stuff so yeah 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 that's that's the way my days go it seems like i do something one day and then i fix fix stuff for two or three days yeah yeah so, yeah. yeah for sure yeah before the little technical difficulty there i hit hit a pop-up here on my screen i don't know if that kicked us off or what but uh anyway uh we're talking about mules and being in the high country and then you you did a pretty cool fence project this year where you drove where you rode mules up into the high country and oh yeah uh, that was a trail clearing project up in idaho oh yes yeah, it wasn't a fence it wasn't a fence job is yeah yeah so i had to pack my chainsaws and brush saws and all my camp back up in there quite a ways and yeah so yes yeah, did you ride in there by yourself 
to do that work or Becky ride up with you or your brother or who was with you? Anybody? Uh, uh, she came up later on. Becky came up later on. But I was first, first three and a half, four weeks, I was up there by myself. And so I packed up, up in there. Uh, went about My first camp about five and a half miles from the trailhead. And then my next camp was about seven miles up in there. So what do you... So what do you do? You ride in, set up camp, and then clear that section of trail, then keep moving your camp camp along the trail until you got it cleared. Is that how you did it? Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. So I took uh, I took one horse and three mules. You know, I'd make a couple, two or three loads up in there and get all my camp set up, and then and then I'd have to come back about about once a week to get the food and supplies and fuel, and beer, and all that. How stuff. many? How many miles can you put on, you know, those mules in a day out there in that country? With the elevation, the ups and downs, what was it like? I mean, did you get – could you ride it out? You probably rode out, spent the night out, and then rode back in the next day when you're coming out for supplies? Um, most of the time, no. Most of the time I'd leave early in the morning, ride five miles to town or six miles, get – Get groceries and stuff and then come back but there's a couple times when i was packing gear up in there i'd i went uh 21 22 miles round trip out of two trips you know so yeah like, yeah but you can do that fairly easy that's a that's daylight to dark but if you got up earlier and, and started a little earlier than than daylight you know then you get 30 miles a day probably <clears throat> your mules can hold up doing that every day Mm -hmm. Or do you gotta give them a, you gotta give them a break or um, you can you can do that about every day if they're shod if you got them shod all the way mm -hmm. around you know they they hold up to it but most time I wasn't I wasn't using them every single day once I I'd, I'd spend a day or so packing and then I'd be cutting brush line and stuff and trail cutting and clearing uh -huh. that trail out so they had days off and most time I just tie my horse up and then kick my mules out and just let them free graze on the hillside while I was working. And they most of the time they don't leave that horse, but when I have a one night one of them was going to, so. <laughs> yeah, tell tell us that story. Oh, yeah, I had I had that horse tied up and mother mules tied up. That was the first night I got there on my camp. and I had one, one mule running, just running loose, I, I believe. I can't remember if I, maybe I tied him up, he came untied, but. I guess he did come untied, came untied, and something spooked him. I think a bear, and he took takes off trotting, and it was like midnight, one o'clock, and and I didn't have time that day to set up my camp, so I was just sleeping under the stars on my on my camp cot, and I wake up and this mule's running by me, and so I jump out of, <laughs> had my sleeping bag, you know, in my underwear, and I put my boots on, and I'm trying to get him caught because he's kind of making a point to head back to the truck you know something something bothered quite a bit and i'm trying to get him to stop and i'm shining the light trying to see where he is and i walk right into the business end of a mule <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah he, i took a trip a lot to the chest and he cracked one of, one of my ribs thought, Man, oh yeah i forgot about that part of it you did get hurt in that wreck that, yeah that little fiasco right there yeah, because he was, he was heading up the trail pretty quick. I thought, man, I don't want to have to ride all the way back out with another mule, get him in the morning. Hopefully he don't end up trotting down the highway. He'd probably find some horses at some pastures below there. He'd probably fall in love with them then. But um, I was trying to get him caught, and man, he he chilly whopped me right there in the ribs, and that knocked me down. I thought, man, this ain't bad. I'm, I'm a good ways up in here. So you're laying on the side of the trail. Yeah. In your underwear and boots <laughs> yeah. and a cracked rib. Yeah, in the dark. In the dark. So that they, they, that would have been something to find the next morning, walking up, you know, hiking that trailer, riding that trail up there. Here's Cleve Dwyer laying in his underwear with nothing but a, a smile and a pair of cowboy boots on. <laughs> I don't know if there'd be a smile. <laughs> day's look. Day's yeah. look. We'll turn it into a day's look. So, yeah, so, I, I got him stopped. I, I, I got him stopped and he turned around to come trotting back down the trail like almost like he's apologetic like hey sorry i didn't know that was you i thought that, I was, thought the bear. that was the bear <laughs> so i got him tied tied up a little better that time and next day i was i was sore I, I taped my ribs up and i just laid after i got the rest of my camp set up which took me a while i just laid there in camp and tried to take it easy and 
taped them ribs up, and the next day I hobbled down the trail and started cutting. But that was, yeah, it's kind of kind of a rough few days. I imagine. So that I'm surprised that that mule m- must not be in love with your horse enough to stick around through whatever spooked him. But oh, he, those he, mules. Yeah, he's in love with that horse big time, but sometimes... What is he... that? Why, why, what do you think that is? I mean, some of these mules... I had a white mule one time, and she just... If there was a if there was a black... My my dad had a, a black mare, and that mule would just about kill herself. She about did kill herself one night uh, when when that horse, horse walked away and he was trying to get untied. I mean, it was something about that. There's some kind of maternal... I love my mommy type stuff in these some of these mules. Yeah, that's what it is. It's that's what a lot of guys claim that that's you know lots of mules. Mother is a mare, so there's always been a maternal bond between a, a mule and, and a horse. Like some of them outfitters, you know, they got 20 mules. If they they got their bell mare, which is kind of their matriarch of their their cabbie of the herd, they just make sure she's tied up or or hobbled right there. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, they can turn all them mules loose, and them mules won't go nowhere. And most times, she's probably going to be one of the horses you ride if you're leading a pack string, or she's going to be right behind the horse that you're riding. And they'll follow her like just like Mother Duck, you know. They'll follow her through hell and back. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Do you see that? Do you see that dynamic change if you if you ride if you ride in on a mule and you you're leading mules in? What what does that do to your do to your pack mentality at that point? What do you mean? Well, I mean, so if a horse, if they're in love with a horse and they'll stay close with a horse in camp, if you don't have a horse in camp, does that change their behavior at all when you're when you're in the back country like that? No, not really. It just it does make them more lovesick. If you got some of their lovesick, they'll be lovesick over a horse more than a mule. Yeah, than one of the other mules, you know. But, I didn't know if it kind of cleared their head. You know, it's it's one of those deals, um, like a gelding. You know, you get a good broke gelding, and and you can just do about anything you want on them. But but it, because you're, you're taking that chemical imbalance away and and stuff like that. But but as far as a, and I'm talking horses there. But I didn't know if you just were with other mules, if it turned into a little more chaos, or they're a little more uncooperative or you had to you had to pick at stuff and t- hobble and and stuff like that rather than just turning stuff out if you had a if you had a you know the old mommy mama mare in in camp with you so yeah yeah you don't have to hobble hardly any of them if, if you got that one that they're in love with that uh, yeah when they look to because they looked at horse kind of almost like to a parent figure or leadership yeah. or something and, but yeah but yeah in it Go ahead. Oh, <clears throat> I got I got a couple mules here that they're in love with each other, and so one of them Dang. she's in love with the other one, and so wherever that one goes, she she kind of wants to go that way too. So that's got a that that causes problems too, though, doesn't it? I mean, when you get them when you get them like that, yeah, you try to try to take one and not the other one. <laughs> the other one's tearing down the rails in the corral or trying to get out. Or I mean, I've seen them do some really stupid stuff over over that yeah sometimes it's hard to get get one of them right away from the other you know they're mm-hmm. called buddy sour it can be a pain in the ass you think man why are you so dang love sick you know how do you That's, get them past it <clears throat> uh, sometimes just just kind of keep riding them away from that mule and it's kind of tough yeah it's kind of tough i know an old lion hunter his name is chuck griffin he gave me, gave me my first dog I remember uh, hunting down there in Arizona. I stayed, stayed camped out right next to his house, and he had a couple of mules, and he kicked them out with the neighbor's horses. And I, he was walking down there one day. I said, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm going down here to grab this mule. He says, this mule's in love with this horse so much. He says, I, I separate her every now and then just to keep her away from that horse. Otherwise, she gets too lovesick when I go lying. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. He'd, yeah. se- he'd separate them, so. Yep. Yeah. It's funny how their brains work, man. I'm telling you, it's yeah. it it definitely adds another layer to everything. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, they're wired wired a little bit different. They're herd animals. So. Yeah, yeah, yep. So th- this lion hunter down in Arizona, who would you say his name was? Chuck Griffin. 
Chuck Griffin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now yeah, he, he's a bear lion and jaguar hunter. He hunted a lot of jaguar down in Belize. No but, kidding. Oh yeah, yeah. I think he hunted down there over a dozen years. What's years. His, What's his opinion? Does he believe a lion can pick up its scent? You know, I never talked to him about that. He's passed on, but I never did talk to him about that. So but, recently, uh, that that tape of Dale Lee talking about lions picking up their scent is kind of you know it's it's going around on uh social media and stuff and people are playing it and uh we've poked some fun at it and i i really thought that at one time i'd made you mad about it um (laughs) and and it was never intended to be that way we were just having fun fun with the whole thing it's kind of like you know i think i told you it's like you know bigfoot and and it, people still think that's real too, but uh, I don't believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> I don't believe. In yeah, Bigfoot. your re- your reply to me was, "Hey, man, I'm not a flat earther." <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, that's that's just one of those things. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, people see what they see, and 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 then it's hard to it's hard to if you haven't it. it if you haven't been there, I mean, who's going to argue with Dale Lee, you know? Yeah. Well, that'd be, that'd be an uphill battle. That'd be like trying to roll rocks uphill all day. Mm-hmm. And if a guy wanted to argue with him, he wouldn't have much grounds to stand on. I mean, he's got a lot of lines, a lot of tough ones, I'm sure too. He's caught a lot of lines, but, but I wish old Dale was still alive. Cause I would sure debate him on, on whether or not lions could pick up their scent. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I think I could hang. I uh-huh. really do. I yep. don't know. I don't know. Yep. yep. We're not. You don't think so? I don't know. It's See, hard. the problem. Well, Chris, the it's, problem. it's hard for somebody like you to argue with Dale Lee. I mean, he's got a lot of, lot of, lot That's of exactly right. Mm-hmm. I know. So, You're taking some, a giant in the, in the community like Dale Lee, mm-hmm. and people would listen to me. It's like, well, who the hell are you? You know? Yeah. You know, I get that. I know. I mean, I don't know. It, it, it'd almost be like saying, well, hey, you don't know anything. He didn't learn anything out of 50 years of lion hunting. Hunting dragging yeah. mountain lions for 50 years, he didn't learn anything. D- that Hey, dude, that's the thing. I'm not going to debate the fact of whether or not he can catch lions. Mm-hmm. Not at all. I would never debate that. I wouldn't debate things about, about you know, dry ground lion hunting with him, but when it comes to the physiological science behind scent i i i'll bet you i could go into any situation and he says hey that lion picked up his scent and i can i can explain it i can explain what actually happened there mm-hmm. well you guys claim that it, they're they're scent pools which i'm sure it does but yeah if that was the case why is it that say if i get to a place where i'm trailing a lion and i'm and i'm having a hard time and i think he's holding his scent pulling his scent wouldn't you think I'd be able to come back and trail that line later on in the day even better because that scent would come down, but I can't, yep. I can't come back but, there five or six hours later and you mm-hmm. still can't. So mm-hmm. if it was scent pooling, like, like you guys kind of think you and Heath Hyatt think, why, why couldn't you trail it better after the scent settled down when you came back four or five, six hours later? Wouldn't you think that that would be the case? Okay. So, so when a lion is walking across, when anything's walking across a landscape, uh-huh. the scent trail on that thing, when they're moving at a steady pace, is narrow. You know, if, if it, let's, let's pick a perfect day, perfect weather condition day. Uh, maybe a little bit overcast, maybe, uh, you know, not a lot of breeze. The humidity is right. The barometric pressure, everything's perfect for trailing that day. And, and you get, I don't care what it is, whether it's a lion or whatever, and they're walking across the landscape at a steady pace, the scent trail is going to be very narrow. Dog's not going to have to, he's going to be zoned in on that dude and he's going to be lining it out and he can move it. When a lion slows down to, he goes on the hunt. All right. Now he's changed his pace and he's, he's slowing way down. And as you sit somewhere and I've seen it with deer hunting is a great example of this, you know, guys can't figure out, uh, especially Eastern deer hunters when they sit in a tree stand, uh, they have deer walk past them all day, all morning, all morning, all morning. And the longer they sit there, then they get deer that are coming up to the edge of that scent pool, and they're they're giving you that alert. And it's like boom, there's something here. And people sit back. And it's like, why'd that deer smell me there? I've had other deer walk through. It's because as we sit in that area and we saturate that area with scent, 
then then we increase the area of which which we polluted. So when a lion slows down and he goes into hump mode, you know, stalking mode, he's he's spending more time in that area. Same with a bedding area or a feeding area, you know. You're not buying it. No, I'm not. <laughs> yep. No, I'm not. Yep. Uh, so so when the dog gets to that scent pool, he's just like boom. You know what happened here, and he can't figure it out. Like when my dogs, when my dogs hit a scent pool, or uh, you know, an area that a low ground area, or if they're trying to work out a track, they don't give me more mouth. They don't stop working, but they don't give me. They actually shut up, and it's like, what the heck just happened right there? Yeah. What? Know. What is that? Why did I lose that track right there? And then you get in there and you look at the area, and they're in a, you know, they're in a kind of a, a little depressed area, and and they're up on the banks and they're circling, they're going out and they're trying to find find the track out, and they can't find it. And, uh, yeah, if you walk, if you, and have you walked those areas? Have you walked, like when you, when you, I know you have, when you've walked that area where you've had a, a, a track loss and you start walking big circles around it, do they pick a track and take it on at that point? Or do you just load them up and go to the truck? No, no, they pick it up, but mm-hmm. there's going to be a place where they're not going to be able to trail it. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's scent pulling. I think it's, <clears throat> I don't know. It's not. It's not like I'm <laughs> saying that mountain lions are some supernatural creature, like a unicorn, and they can just fly away or something. No. And yeah. it's, but there's something that happens when they're stalking deer. They're they're getting ready to lay up. They get nervous. I you think it's ironic that it's always harder to trail them right before they lay up, or in, in situations where they would most likely be nervous i don't think they consciously think of it like that i think they subconsciously probably think that way you know they just get nervous and something happens in there and makes them hold their scent and there's a lot of guys that are probably gonna argue with that but not very many dry ground line hunters i don't think they're gonna argue with me yeah we had we see the same thing this time of year on raccoons believe it or not here in in uh the east persimmons are ripe so the in the acorn and the oak trees are producing a lot of acorns and and so the the area just becomes saturated with scent you can take you can take the best coon dog hunt them all the way up until right now and all of a sudden it's like this thing just turned into an idiot on me and it's it's they'll start slick tree and they're trying to win coons i mean they the tracking conditions uh it's compounded because we during october traditionally in the east, you know, it becomes drier. You get leaf litter on the ground. The the composition or the the uh, bacteria and composition of the ground is changing here, and then and then you add that factor, and you can make a good dog look like a real idiot right now. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, probably so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's just it's something that's fun to talk about, and you know, I'm like I said. Cleve, I, I mean, I wouldn't, di- I wouldn't argue with Dale Lee. I wouldn't argue with you about what you're seeing and and how to catch lions, but it's fun to talk about and it's fun to debate and it adds a layer of mystique and uh, you know different things. I mean, if it was easy, that'd suck. Everybody'd be out here with the, every border collie and chihuahua and everything else catching lions. Well, what else you got? You sent me a big thing <laughs> of notes. It's stuff you stuff you wanted to to talk about. You, did you? Ke- run a copy of those or yeah i got them but um yeah yeah there's some some notes you know i had about hunting crested snow and and just kind of hunting tough conditions like like in february and march late january when we get them january thaws that can be that can be a tough time to catch lines whether you got snow or not and that oftentimes that snow gets sloppy and slushy and Mm-hmm. real wet in the daytime and at night it's freezes like concrete and right and uh i think you and i you talk, and i talked about that and it's just it can be tough and a guy can miss a lot of line tracks on that crust of the snow because what happens is a guy steps out of that pickup truck and it's you know a little after daylight and he, he thinks there's a lion track there he saw one that was should have been headed that way or something and he's looking for a lion track so he steps out and he walks around and crunches his the boot of his toe in there and he thinks well that line should have made a track here oftentimes that, that snows like concrete right you know right at daylight and just because your boot makes an imprint doesn't mean that line track's going to 
and uh that can be tough that can be tough trail and and uh sometimes what are you looking what are you looking for then i mean do were your dogs were your dogs rig or were they you know what how are you if you not making a track what are you looking for during that time of year if it's not making a track sometimes you want to kick them out you know let them dogs free cast hunt it whether you're roading them up the road or or if you're hiking but um, mm -hmm. if they're hitting it every now and then here and there on that crusted snow, it's just cold trail and pecking. Yeah, just pecking away, and it's not consistent. If it's consistent and you know you're going the right direction, it's best just let them trail. But um, if they're not making any headway and they're just wadding up, it's best to go to a south face and slope because during that time of year, that crusted snow doesn't hold scent. You know, it's 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 not really porous and it doesn't retain scent well. So you'll circle out onto a south. Maybe they pick up their scent when they walk across crested snow. It's possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll stop. Yeah. I'll stop. All right. Yeah. Uh, I got a question. For, and I actually, I actually used some of the conversations you and I've had. And one of the most valuable thing, not the most valuable, but one thing that stuck with me that I've really let happen more since, since you and I started recording these podcasts you said, you know, just let your dogs trail. Don't mm -hmm. don't be jumping in the middle of it and just let them do what they do. And that stuck with me, man. I, I, I'll tell you, there's been a lot of bear tracks and stuff. I'll give you an example. You go down the road, my dogs will rig all day long on a bear. I mean, they will. I think they're rig, probably rig on a coyote too, so I have to really watch them. But, but uh, uh, if I find a bear track... And I dump those dogs out instead of giving up five minutes and getting frustrated. You know, I've had to let them get off the road and really work out and even, even walk up on the mountainsides and, and up and down the road and do circles and kind of help them. Because in the past, you know, the only thing I've dropped them on would be like that track that I know's there. It's a guaranteed, I can put them on the track. They're going to take it and they're going to go, but the, that doesn't make a dog. You know, that doesn't make a bear dog when you or any kind of dog when they can work out the tough stuff. And and when you started talking about that and, and stress and just letting them trail, I've done a lot of that this fall and I really like doing it and it's helping them. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes a guy can, sometimes a guy overhandles his dogs, you know, and it sometimes doesn't help, help all that much. Sometimes like hunting dry ground if you you're pecking away and you're making a little bit of progress and then you lose it and then you pick it up again and lose it again and they, they them dogs still know the lines there sometimes you can circle out to another ridge or something and pick it up again but it's going to be harder to get them dogs on that track once you pick it up versus when they were hunting for it right there because mm -hmm. i already know there's line track there they just start circling around and working it. Somebody's going to hit it, especially if you've got five or six dogs. There's it's about a right number, seven dogs. Somebody's going to hit it and then take it and move it again. But sometimes if you get ahead of them and, and you call them to that track, sometimes you bring them up there and they can move it, but nothing like they were moving it before. It's almost like you yeah. break, you break their momentum, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, it's like, Sometimes, sometimes I look back on that and say, man, I would have just been better off just to sit on my mule and just watch them trail and not, not get in the middle of them at all. And just as so long as I know they're going the right direction, just let them trail. So sometimes you can Which, high point and figure it out for them. But if, if you know they're going the right direction and they're consistent, somewhat consistent, just let them trail it. It's tough, man. I'll tell you, it, it, I think, I think it would be easier the way you're hunting, you know, cause a lot of times you're up there on your mule with your hounds and it's just you and the hounds. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, and I'm not saying easier hunting. I'm saying it would be easier to be patient in the East when you're bear hunting, you know, you, you get the rig strike and of course you're hunting with a, a group of hunters and stuff like that. And Heath kind of, Heath and I kind of touched on this, um, in a podcast we just dropped called the perfect dog. But I don't care who you are, man. You get you get into that. You put pressure on yourself and you build pressure on yourself because as soon as you hit that rig strike, you get on the radio and say, hey, I got a strike down here. You know, you put a couple dogs down. It's, it's just two or three minutes and people are blowing up the radio. Hey, you got it going. You got it going. You got one running. What's going on? 
And instead of just slowing down and letting your dogs work, you, we create this pressure on ourselves to put them back in the truck and go find a better track to run. And uh, anymore, I'm telling you, I just get on the radio. It, somebody asks me what they're doing. What are they doing in there? You know, my response more and more is the best they can. That's what they're doing. They're doing the best they can. You yeah. Know, you got and and a lot of times I'll tell guys, hey, go see if you can. I'm gonna try to work this out. Go see if you can find another one. You know, to get started. I'm gonna I'm gonna if something happens here, I'll let you know. Yeah, exactly. Because somebody that's ramrodding, you know, they're impatient. <clears throat> they're gonna want to be getting it going faster, but sometimes slow is fast. Oftentimes, drag around line and slow is fast. Yeah, you get, that's a you get going too fast. You're gonna screw yourself. We yeah, that's a uh, slow is fast. You know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast type type thing. But yeah, slow. You're right. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, that's exactly. a good point. Yeah. We just we just get impatient. You know, we I don't care who it is. Um, I've been guilty of it. You don't want your dog to look like it like you don't have have dogs on the truck with you know with when you're out hunting with people so you just kind of ramrod and maybe cherry pick your track and and you know don't drop on it and a lot of times man if you want to have that next level dog you just gotta let them do it don't you yeah just let them grind it out you know it's yeah like, sometimes it's my motto is if if you're ever in doubt whether you're going the right way or the wrong way or if you're on a two-day old track or a one-day old track or a five-hour old track when in doubt just let them trail They'll sort it out. Somebody will, especially if you got four or five good ones in there. Just and in doubt, just let them trail. That's the best thing to do. I yeah. mean, if you know, you know for certain that there are ways behind it, they're going backwards on that track or something, then straighten them out and get it sorted out. But sometimes we're the worst thing in there. Sometimes you yeah. sit. <laughs> my brother and I talked about that a while back. Sometimes it's best to just sit on a ridge and just watch them. Don't get in the middle of them. Just let them trail. A lot of guys, I, I see a lot of guys do it, and they get right up in, in the middle of them. They want they want pictures of their dogs and videos of their dogs trailing. And it's like, well, they're, they're trailing pretty good now, but when they hit a tough spot, you might be in the middle of them too much, and that's not going to help them. Mm-hmm. Once they get that track going good, that's none of our business, you know? Yeah, you know? I can't smell it. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. That's why I've got them along. Yeah, that's, that's what they got that sniffer for. That's right. There's a there's a saying in the police dog world, uh, and I used to tell people this all the time. You know, I'd get my canine out and we'd start tracking. It's like, do you think you can track it? And I'd say, well, I can't, but I know she can. You know, I, but I'm the weakest link here. I'm the weakest link in this team right here. I've got to trust that dog to do what she does. And man, she would prove me wrong so many times. We were we were. This is kind of a morbid story, but it proves my point. We had um, a situation where I still remember the day. It was a bright, bright sunny day. It was September. We were right in this time when tracking conditions get a little tougher around here and uh, hitting a little dry patch. And we had a, a girl that, that had walked off and left a note. That, you know, it was all over. She was going to, she was going to commit suicide. And, um, uh, we tracked her back from the house. I found the track at the back of the house and we walked all the way back. We tracked all the way back to this water hole. It was probably a quarter mile behind the house. And there was a bottle of pills and, and some different stuff right there, but there were a lot of tracks around too, foot tracks. She had walked around and she had walked off and then she came back in another direction. And my dog kept wanting to jump out into this water hole. And I, around here, I didn't think that water hole was deep enough that, that I couldn't see something in there and she would, she would jump in the water hole and she would swim around on top of the water and she was biting at the water and chomping. So this proves my point that I'm the weak link. I mean, I should be putting some things together here. I should be thinking, okay, there's something here. No, not me, man. You know, I got, I got police officers all around me and my dog's trying to cool off because she's hot. That's what I'm thinking. I'm reeling her in on that line, like a fish, you know, and trying to cast her down this track that I thought was going this way. And she'd go about five feet and she, she did this three times and she churned up this girl's jacket that she was wearing oh. and one of the one of the policemen that was standing up on on a ridge you know it's like a little falls come down it's like there's something in the water right there what we had a we called in a scuba diver he went in there he didn't even have to put on his tank he just wiped it in 
grabbed her and pulled her out. Oh, gotcha. So tr- trust your dog, let her, let him track that to me, for me, that's the most, um, descriptive thing that I've ever seen on the value of trusting your dog. You know, I was right there. I saw the whole thing and I can tell you that I was the dumbest one there. That dog, that dog had it figured out and she was trying to tell me. Oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah. She can smell it. You couldn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing stuff. But, uh, let's get back to the track conditions <laughs> and, and different things. You were talking about crusted snow and so when you're when you're hunt, typically hunting out there, do you do you kind of make a quick sweep through those areas that you know you're not really going to see a good track on, and then try to make it to the to the south facing slope, so you know where the weather condition could be a little better? What do you do in situations like that? Yeah, on that crusted snow, that scent's not going to hold. So when that snow about that time of year when that snow gets crusted and sloppy, <clears throat> that's when your south facing slopes. They sometimes get muddy and sloppy too, but if there's some yeah. some patches of dirt and stuff on there, that dirt holds scent quite well. Mm-hmm. So you'll make a circle out to the to that south facing slope where I think that line would have been headed to, and you have your dogs free cast. And about, about, about an hour after daylight is when that scent starts to kind of lift pretty good. That frost is burning off, that sun's melting that frost. And mm-hmm. for, it seems like from about an hour after daylight to right before noon, them dog can trail pretty good and then an hour or so before noon it starts turning slop again that can be yeah and then yeah you got two or three hours of trailing in the slop and then about two thirty three o'clock in the winter time you know that's when it starts getting cold again when that's that sun starts kind of getting close to that rise and it starts going down that uh that scent kind of almost like kind of pulls back into that into that mud or that med just kind of pulls it back into it that can be tough you, you still trail it you just don't trail it as fast as, and as consistent so yeah. but yeah if you if you think man there's a lion there's got to be a lion here and that line should have went over here walk the big south face of slopes or ride your mule in there or kick some dogs out on on there and just let them free cast it and and um, if they strike it you know, kind of stay out of their way and just let them work it once yeah. we get to that crusted snow again, uh, it, it might. Hey, be you know that you know that you know that microphone you got on that headset there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's rubbing up against your shirt. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, about that. You still got a hand loose to grab the Snoopy cup and take a slurp of coffee if you need to. Okay, there you <laughs> go. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're good. So so when you're when you get into that sloppy stuff, you said they slow down. What are they, what do you think's causing that? What do you think that is? I don't know. <clears throat> I think sometimes that, that crust of snow doesn't hold the scent. When that line walked through there, you know, midnight, one o'clock, right. 10, 10 o'clock at night or whatever. So it's frozen. It doesn't hold scent as well. Mm-hmm. And then when the sun comes out, you know, that it starts to melt. So that probably doesn't help it any either. Have you ever have you ever seen a track that was like frozen in? I mean, it looked it, you could tell that it was made in the slush, probably, you know, early in the evening the night before. Yep. And then and then you can't run it, but you come back and it thaws out a little bit. Can you run it then? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, and then once it starts to freeze again, sometimes it's kind of weird. Sometimes you'll be able to trail to, trail a ways again mm-hmm. once it starts to freeze up again and once it freezes rock solid again then it's tough tough once more so yeah kind of kind of weird some some sometimes it's in, inconsistent how that scent acts but but um but how yeah. do you age how do you age tracks like that Cleve? Um, when you're when you're looking at a track that's frozen in the snow how how do you age that track to know to, to say okay it was the night before or maybe it's maybe it's three days old yeah, if it's like in that slush and stuff, you'll you'll be able to look at that and see how much how much melt has you know, or how much water's melted into it and then refroze again. And then if you if you're looking at say, you know, a slush track, that's how you, you kinda determine that. If you're just looking at that crust, you know, crusted snow and there's dirt on top of it, then he obviously walked probably in the evening because that dirt was soft enough still that he transferred to his foot 
But in the evening, it started, say, 3 or 4 o'clock, it started to freeze up enough to hold him to where he's not breaking through it. So then you look at it and say, well, that was either yesterday evening or evening before. But if it's real fresh dirt and that, that dirt hasn't melted down into the crust. I was going to ask you about that. That's what's going to be my next question about seeing that, you know, the dirt that's actually frozen down in the track. That's, has, that's hasn't been through it. down in there, you know? Yeah. Then, then you're that, like, oh, what's that? Oh, I was just oh. yeah. Go go with it, man. So if it if you it's look, like you're reading my mind. If you look at that that track and it's frozen, and you can't see no toe prints hardly at all, but you can see that dirt and it hasn't leached down into that crust of snow, then you say, okay, that that was probably yesterday. But if it yeah. has leached down in there and melted down into there, and it's kind of started to turn the mud on the surface, then that might be a, a day a day's worth or two days worth of of sun on that on that track. Yeah, that track's gone through a freeze and thaw, you know, at least once, maybe a couple times at that point, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so there's a lot of transitions back and forth, and that doesn't doesn't help you on scent, of course. That's yeah, a lot of a lot of inconsistencies in the weather and all that. That that doesn't help you at all. But sometimes you still get a couple barks out of it and try to figure out where that line went, and even if you can't can't move it, then you then you can sometimes circle out and try to hit it again. Once they get it going, just kind of let them trail. I used to have a picture of a track that we we tried to run on the Navajo, and uh, it was exactly what you said. It was you could tell the the dirt had leached down into it, and it actually, you know, and you can tell. I mean, dirt on top of the frozen crust of snow. I mean, you can put your finger on it and pick up dirt. When you get that track that's that looks muddy in the track, and you can't really pick up any dirt out of it. You know, that's been there a day or two, and our dogs did exactly what you said. You know, it's, uh, you got a couple barks out of it, and you're hopeful, and you're thinking, yeah, I got a cold trailing dog, and the wheels just fall off. I mean, it, it, you realize they want to try it, but sometimes you're just in over their head. Yeah. And you can't. Yeah, yeah, you're hoping, man, if they could just get it, they just move it over this ridge. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> if they're just wadded up, it's, probably not gonna happen yeah. you know sometimes you're just hammering away right there and you know not going any place but, but yeah that's <clears throat> that can be that can be a little bit tough but after the sun goes down <clears throat> then it gets even tougher because then it's almost like that that cold freeze dries or pulls that scent back in and it seems like after dark or right at dark that's that's when it gets really tough again and so that point, sometimes it's best just to come back the next day, put a game plan together, try to figure out mm -hmm. where he's going and where to, where to start the next day. How, how long have you actually stayed on the line track? I mean, like you're on your mule, you're in the back country, you start a track. Will you start one in the afternoon? Will you start a track in the afternoon if you find a, a decent track and try to run it? Yeah, if it's fresh. But <clears throat> if I think that line is going to be jumpy and try to outrun you, We'll hold off until the next day. Mm -hmm. And then we come back in there and then you got a early first you know, your early track first thing in the morning and try to try to figure him out. But if you think he's right there, yeah, we'll we'll trail him in the evening, of course. But if if you if think you're, you're gonna get out ran, I we'll probably probably wouldn't. <laughs> have you ever have you ever camped overnight on a track? Um stayed I, out overnight? <clears throat> no, not per se. No, I've never camped out and then started the next morning but there's been times i had to camp out overnight and walk out the next day you know well yeah. I, t I take that back i did one time um over on the utah nevada border and uh, i rode my horse up into this canyon and it was uh, late october it's cold and i got up there and i was trailing this female line all day and dogs are just trailing all over in this canyon i just sat there and listened to them it starts getting dark and i started coming out of there and I had to leave two dogs up there. I thought, well, I'll gather them up in the morning. And I went out there and rode out to these big bluffs, and my flashlight quit me. So I was like, well, I'll just go back. And they built me a fire. And the next morning, I, I, I didn't have nothing to eat. I already ate all my food earlier that day. And so the next morning, I just saddled my. That sounds like me. Saddled up and rode that canyon again. And I hit that line track again and trailed it for another three quarters of a mile and I could couldn't trail it any any further that day but I was trailing the track from the day before so that track uh -huh. was a day and a half old you know so I started that one but most of the time no I most of the time I don't have to so 
Yeah, Van Johnson wrote that, you know, in his book, he wrote about trailing those lions and, and riding out and staying all night on a track and, and doing things like that. It, it, and you just don't find people, a lot of people that, that hunt like that anymore. I mean, what do you think's changed on that front? Is it because we're more mobile? We've got better technology and GPS tracking. I mean, that, <clears throat> yeah, you, you have, you have better four wheel drives. So you can get into places yeah. better. You got side by sides, you got mm -hmm. GPS. So you can look at it and say, well, if you're a new country you can look at it and say, well, hell, I know where to find that line tomorrow. I don't have to camp out on him all night. Go back in there the next day and get a chance you're going to find him. And then one of the other drainages that he was headed towards. And then yeah. you got communication. So you can communicate with people to pick you up if you if you get up there you don't have to stay up yeah. there all night you know <laughs> back you know some guys if if they don't they don't have any choice they don't want to walk out in the middle of the dark with a bunch of big rims and stuff if yeah might as well stay up there and then keep hunting the rest of the day you know but i think it's a combination of both so. you guys so you talk about communications is it a pretty common thing when you're when you're bogging down on a track and you're looking at your GPS and you're, and like you said, you know where that line probably crossed out. So you just send a message out and say, Hey, go up and check this saddle and see if you see a track coming out. Yeah. Yeah. That are radios or phones. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They do that some. Yeah. Especially if there's, you know, there's two of you on one track, of course. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. you can call, call a buddy and say, Hey, hey if you haven't been there, go check this out. But most times that don't work. Not out here because it's so far from town, you know, between towns. But yeah, we do that some. Yeah. Yeah. What else you got for us, Cleve? Oh, yeah. You know, on them, on them south facing slopes where you get them dogs trailing over there, sometimes that, that mud that mud that's standing that or that mud that has standing water in it you'll you won't be able to trail them tracks very good but when you get over into that softer dirt you'll be able to trail them good you'll just want to make sure them dogs aren't going backwards because they they'll still go backwards and then they'll go back to where they last had that track maybe you'll right where the crusted snow ends and the good dirt ends and sometimes that wad up there just make sure they don't go backwards but on that on that crusted sloppy snow and that frozen mud you just you might have to leapfrog and help them out throughout the day if you're not moving that track at all. But once they get it going, then most time you got a good chance of catching up to that lion. Sometimes them lions will walk down that frozen frozen mud or like on a gravel road, and you'll you'll be thinking that you're going to find that track in the dirt there. But even that that ground that or that dirt that has a little bit of subsurface moisture. In the daytime, your your boots making a good imprint imprint on it, you know, and you think, well, that lion should have made a track here. At night, at midnight or two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, it's it's probably frozen like concrete too. So mm -hmm. you just gotta, sometimes you just got to sit back and let them dogs hunt for it again, and just use your own judgment. But that that sometimes is as tough as dry ground hunting. That's like when we get in that crusted stuff. When it gets real sloppy up north, like in the springtime, oftentimes we'll we'll go someplace where there's not much snow, hardly any snow at all. It's all almost all dry ground where the snow has receded, mm -hmm. and it sets that dirt up just about right. <clears throat> and when that dirt sets up, kind of fluffy a little bit, man, you can trail them really good. So sometimes you're in that crusted snow and slop, and you're breaking stuff and four-wheel drives going out in your truck and you're getting trailers stuck sometimes it's better just to go someplace where there's no snow at all and just right. let them trail because you can think about that versus the mud when you get into that dry ground that consistent dry ground you can trail more consistent than just slop you know mm -hmm. seems like that slop if you're going to catch them and that stuff they they, they you know if they don't go too far you got a pretty good chance but if they go quite a ways you're going to be playing leapfrog all day long but you can do so it. so when you when you talk about you know you're talking about leapfrogging and helping them out and helping them sort when do you make the decision to let them trail and get in there and help them what what's your what's your standard for that mm, that's a good question really good question so if they're if they're wadding up there and they're not moving it and they don't move it for I don't know, 45 minutes, that might be time to go out there and, and look. But let them trail, you know, trail around there and work on it for 
45 minutes. And if you don't get a bark in half hour, 45 minutes, it might be time to leapfrog ahead, sometimes longer than that. If if they're whipping their tails and they're not barking, but you can tell that they're they're getting some kind of scent and just let them work it. Mm-hmm. And most time that'll be your the dog that figures that out will be your free up dog. Your anchor dog might be still hammering hammered away. But yeah, forty five minutes to an hour sometimes and if st- still nothing breaks loose then make a make a big circle. And if they are going really, really slow, here's something to think about. If they're really going real slow and you think, man, they're not going to get that going. Oftentimes, it's better to circle out, find that track, what direction that track's going. You'll find it in that softer dirt, or you might find a scratch in, a, in one of them saddles breaking over mm-hmm. to the south-facing slope. Once you find that, then call your dogs to you and call them out of that canyon to you, whatever you, you got, whatever command you got to call them to you. Every guy should have a command that, you know, that means you dogs need to come here. I got the track. We got all of our sc- you know, train that way to where I can call them out of a canyon mm-hmm. off of a cold track. You might yeah. have to tone them a little bit and get them to, to you. Cause sometimes it's easier to leave them there trailing and pecking away. And you can sort that track out without a thousand dog tracks and all over it. And you can figure out exactly which way you went and you can walk it out for a couple, two or 300 yards and get a feel for that line. And then go back and call your dogs. Yeah. So, that's another good tip. So what I'm seeing here is, you know, you're letting the, if they're busy and they're working and you know, they're struggling, you're not going down there and looking under their nose to see what they're working on. You're working the area around them. You're, you're going out so that you're not distracting them and they're not messing up things for you. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And you'll, yeah, Man, it's so tempting to run down there and see what are they doing? You know, you run down there in the middle of them and what are they doing? and trying to figure it out. And then you got your, I can see how that could cause a lot of confusion. Cause all of a sudden you're in the middle of it and they're coming over to see what you're doing and tracking everything up. Yeah. That's, that is a valid, that's a good one. Yeah. Especially if they see you kneeling down, looking at something. Oh yeah. As you notice they'll all swarm over there. Cause they think, Oh yeah, he's got something and they think, okay, yep. That's, that's gotta be it. He's, He's got something we don't have, you know. Right. But, but yeah, that's that's something the guy needs to keep in mind. But just because mm-hmm. your boot your boot makes an impression in in that dirt or snow or mud in the daytime doesn't mean that lion is at night. There's I missed a lot of lions because of that. There's been times I knew other guys were hunting an area and they probably knew about the same lion I was after. And you know they just keep driving by because they think, well, that lion track would break through this snow or. He, he should have made a, an impression in this dirt and go back in there and free cast some dogs right before they went through. And, you know, sometimes you, you see the guy coming out of there. Or most of the time you just see where he drove in there before you made it in there that day. And I'm going to kick dogs out anyhow and just rode them in there and, and uh, let them strike it and just make sure you're going the right direction. Yeah, there's been times I've found where other people were ahead of me and it didn't matter because they missed him. They're, you know, they're going – 15 mile an hour thinking they're going to cut a line track and that stuff and just rode dogs up that canyon so mm-hmm. sometimes what works good on that is uh, if you got two people you get to the top of a canyon and you think that line should have been on one of them cells have have one guy drop the other guy off at the top and then he can walk that whole ridge that south facing ridge all the way down and if he's not there and if you don't have mules, if he's not there, get get in the truck, have that guy take you to the next canyon, take it all the way to the top, and walk down that ridge. That way you're not walking uphill and you can make good time. That's that's pretty efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever tried to track, uh, you know, just sight track lines without hounds? You ever spend any time out in the mountains just, you know, really honing your tracking skills, you know, where you, or do you spend so much time out there? The reason I ask is because I was talking to a guy that, uh, actually we're trying to line it up to get him on the podcast, but he spent a lot of time just sight tracking, you know, just Ooh. spot and stalk sight tracking. Yeah. And he also, he also hunts with hounds now. Hmm. And he claims that through his experience of being able to sight track, even on, I mean, we all hear the old stories about guys that could track, 
track people over rock, you know, and, and things like that just by a, a scuff and a, and a piece of, you know, uh, moss or, you know, just something that most people would walk past and not see. But because he spent so much time doing that, and now he implicates those skills with his hounds. Have you ever done anything like that? No, I never really <clears throat> went and tracked them down without dogs. I've had to track them by myself when my dogs were off on a different yeah. line or doing something else. And, mm-hmm. you know, I track them for quite a while, but no, yeah. not, not specifically going out there without dogs. No, I haven't. I, I would say that the way you hunt, you probably spend so much time looking for lion tracks that it just kind of comes second nature to you, uh, you know, because when the dogs are busy, you're tracking and, and when they're tracking, you're still tracking. And, you know, it's just amazing how all those skills come together. That's That was the amazing part for me. But I thought, you know, if we could get a guy that was a top shelf land tracker, you know, you, you, the guys I think about are the especially are the guys over in South Africa, you know, some of those, some of the native uh, handlers and trackers out there, they're tracking stuff without dogs all the time. And, and I've talked to guys that have hunted in situations like that. And they're like, man, I couldn't even see the track. And he was pointing to this stuff. And once he started pointing it out, I was like, Oh, okay. You know, and even at that point you're like, oh, okay, maybe this guy's full of crap. And then boom, you know, you, you end up, you end up, finding the animal you're looking for so i don't know it's just something that came up i thought would be interesting but i'd say you do so much of it anyway that it's it's kind of second nature and you've developed your tracking skills out of necessity while you're out there with your hounds yeah 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 you know yeah it comes second nature to you after a while and pretty soon you don't even think about it you you get a pretty good feel for them too i think about tracking you know a lot of people think, oh, you're tracking something. You're tracking it, track for track. No, that's that's not always the case. So you, you're gonna you're gonna lose it, and then you're gonna you're gonna find that you need to figure out where that line would have gone, you know. And then mm-hmm. that's when knowing their habits comes into play. Well, he he was zigzagging all over in here. He he might have dumped out the bottom, or he was in a straight line going across these ridges. He's probably gonna hit that saddle. And if you can't yeah. see his track anymore, go over there and you find that track in the saddle, and you kind of leapfrog or or whatever and get get ahead of it <clears throat> but yeah there's a book i think you guys were talking about it and i've read some of it uh science and art of tracking by uh ludenberg mm-hmm. and that's a that's there's some pretty good points in there it's it gets pretty technical if you haven't read the if somebody hasn't yeah. read the book but it's it's quite technical but there's some really really good points in there and you think man they delve quite deep into that thing and it's like man that's there's some really good points i don't never thought of that That's the problem with a lot of the books. You know, the reason I read those books was because I had to, you know, it was my job. It was my job to read them. I didn't have, I had tests on them and things like that. So I had to, and then, but just to pick up some of these books that we talk about, I mean, sometimes they're like watching paint dry. I mean, they can be, or they can be a deep dive into stuff. It's like, it's hard to keep your attention. It's not like, you know, watching a TikTok video, you know, uh, you got, you got to want to increase your skills and your knowledge and, and things like that to really dive in. But you're right. Anybody that is serious about understanding tracking and scent and all that stuff, you, you gotta, you gotta take those deep dives every once in a while. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. If you don't, <clears throat> if you don't have tough tracks and stuff to kind of challenge yourself, you're not going to get better, you know? Fair weather yeah. never made good sailors. Wow. You know, that, it yep. Yep. That's a good that's a good one to keep in mind too. For sure. Yeah. What sure. else what else you got, Cleve? I think that's about it. That's enough for this week. We've already beat you up about lines picking up their scent. We've 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 got some good points out there about about uh we heard the mule story about you laying out beside the trail in your underwear. That's a good one. Yeah. Um uh, <laughs> oh you're a good sport cleve i appreciate you man yep all right you betcha have a good one you guys got you guys got a bit busy winter planned oh yeah 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 got, got quite a few got quite a few hunters booked up always got that's great he's got fill, holes to fill you know little gaps here and there to fill in but yeah it should be a pretty good year yeah there's, there's some big toms running around so good yeah yeah, yeah for sure see 
So you've already been out doing a little bit of scouting around, getting ready, huh? Yeah, and then I got got deer and elk hunters that let us know when they see them. You know, they don't. They're yeah. not a fan of mountain lions. So yeah, I was right. told told about one the other day, the big lion. There's not a whole lot of lions in there these days. A lot of guys kill them, but there's a big one in there now. So, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a few lions around. There's there should be some good ones. Yeah. yeah. All right, buddy. Well, I'll talk to you soon. And uh, until next time, yeah. you when follow in, your hounds and I'll follow mine. Yeah, when in doubt, just let them trail. So, all right. We'll, all right. Yeah, we'll, we'll close it out with that. When in doubt, let them trail. Yeah. All right, Sam. So.